one of the subjects that just absolutely dominates our discourse in this culture right now, especially with the bill that was passed in Florida recently, is the subject of transgenderism and transsexualism, whether or not even those, maybe they're the same thing, maybe they're not, all of that. And should they be permitted in sports and all of this? And churches the world over, but specifically in the West, are wrestling with the idea of how do we approach how do we evangelize these specific individuals? Because they're coming into churches all over the place. They are. And they're asking for resources, especially in an economy like this where everyone is hurting. They're coming in. They're asking for help and so forth. What do we do? Someone that is wearing a dress but is clearly biologically male or so forth. Like they come into your church. What do you do? Or someone that is a teenager that has actually endured some manner of indoctrination one way or another about this. What do you do? And this hit home with us specifically because we, uh, some of the people that my wife and I are engaged in ministry over and with, struggle with this. And the collision occurred of one person had the opinion of that that is a sin. And it needs to be repented of. And then another person had to burn. It's not a sin. It's just a sin to act on it. What do we do? Well, I think there's various ways that we can approach this hermeneutically and philosophically. One is um, that it is a product of sinful, fallen culture. That people would not think these kinds of things about themselves, the idea of being born in the wrong body, if, in fact, you had a good and righteous perspective of yourself, your role in society, and God's sovereign creation. You wouldn't have thoughts like this if, in fact, that you had those things aligned correctly. And so what they would say is, because those things are broken or out of alignment, that is what has led you into this path of beginning to believe things that are wrong about your biology and about your psychology, that these things are downstream from those preemptive theological issues, and that the proper course of action is to correct that homartiology, the theology of human fallenness or the human flaw, and Christology and um, these various other kind of Christian theological matrices and gears basically trying to reconstruct the clock, put the gears back into place of your right viewing of yourself and of your place in society and so forth. That you have a problem in your identity, that identity problem is kind of blossoming out and fruiting out this brokenness, this form of transgenderism, transsexualism, and so forth. That, that's, that's one way to approach it. A second way to approach this is the idea of kind of the LGBT, kind of, or what you want to say is kind of what a lot of people have said about same-sex attraction, is that it's not necessarily sinful, but it is sinful to act on it. The way people would say that, um, like, it's not inherently sinful to be uh, heterosexually attracted to someone. It is wrong to lust. It is, they would say the same thing, that it is not necessarily wrong to be homosexually attracted, but it is wrong to lust or to act on those kind of sensations. So there's that, of that if you feel like you were born in the wrong body, that you were something along that line, maybe it's that you can, like, thinking that thought and then acting on it uh, in the direction of um, transvestitism, right? Wearing clothes, drag, or um, wear, uh, and taking the hormones, pursuing... Uh, sex reassignment, things like that, that those would be the sinful actions 
but just the mental state is not necessarily sinful. So that's, that's a second way to approach this. Number three would be that it's not sinful, right? We have to address this matter. Some people would say that it's not sinful, that in fact the opposite would be true of that ignoring this thing or denying yourself these things, that that would be the sin, and that there's a ton of activists out there that would say that claim, right? That's a third way to approach this. The fourth would be a that this is a product of mental illness, that this is a gender dysphoria, this is a biological dysphoria, that you have a maybe a chemical imbalance, a mental disorder present, and that you need to have clinical, psychological, or psychiatric treatment for that mental dis-ease. That's what you need. And that, of course, splits in two directions of there's the, the treatment along the lines of that you need to not think this way or that you need to take medications to make you not think this way. And then there's the, the reason that you believe this is that you truly are a woman in the flesh of a man or that you are truly biologically uh, a female in the flesh of a male or whatever and that the, the psychological treatment for that is gender affirming whatever so that's of course so you have all these different ways to approach this the question is what is the truth and then we need to also discuss what about people that are already a good ways down the road on this. They've already taken the hormones or maybe an adult caregiver has forced those hormones or surgery or something along the line has forced that upon you and that damage has already been done or that change has already taken place that can't be undone. What about those individuals? And I think that there's actually some manner of scripture that we can use to speak to all of this. It's in Matthew chapter 19, the legendary passage where Jesus is teaching. Um, he's confronted by religious leaders trying to trap him on the subject of divorce, right? So there's that section that goes all the way to verse 10, verse nine, that Jesus says very clearly, Sexual immorality is the only grounds for adultery, uh, adultery in divorce, right? That's the only reason to get a divorce, adultery. If there's no adultery present, divorce is not an option. And then verse 10, the disciples say to him, kind of pulling him aside, listen, if such is the case of a man and his wife, it is better never to marry. They're saying that if you're really going to hem people in like this, people aren't going to want to get married which actually a lot of people would make that same argument. If you can't just freely get divorced over whatever you want, then people aren't going to want to get married as much. Verse 11, But he said to them, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have been made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive this. And people have debated what is being meant here. A eunuch, if you didn't know, is a person who has been biologically altered in their flesh for the purpose of serving a specific, uh, usually either religious or a political service. There's a lot of people that are biblical scholars that allege that Potiphar, from the story of Joseph in Genesis, that he was probably a eunuch. And that's what actually is kind of the underlying basis, because he's supposed to be the captain of the king's guard, that maybe he was a eunuch, and that means that he was unable to perform sexually for his wife, and that is what caused her to pursue Joseph. There's a theory there. There's some basis for that. And that's one of the main reasons why often a man is 
has this alteration to them and it gen that is has their genitals altered in a specific way so that there's no risk of them accidentally or intentionally impreg impregnating one of the king's harem or uh, one of the other women in the palace. It makes them a less of a threat to harming the the king's wards in that way. And so that's one reason that sometimes this just happens to you. You're born into a family that serves the king in a specific way, and then this is just done to you. You don't have a choice. And then there's also those who are religious. There's a lot of ancient um, kind of cultic sects that they would emasculate themselves for the purpose of, um, let's say, focusing themselves more on whatever their religious was, religion happened to have been or that they simply, without biologically altering themselves, would just choose to be celibate, right? Think of like Catholic priests or various monastic orders that way, that they would just, we're not going to do this, right? And so some have had this done to them. They didn't have a choice. Maybe they were born this way biologically. Maybe they were altered after birth um, by accident or on purpose. Or maybe they've done this to themselves by accident or on purpose. And as a result, like the Levitical law says specifically, if a person has had their genitals damaged, that they are no longer eligible for service in the temple if they are a Levite, or they're also no longer eligible to even join the congregation of Israel in their annual feasts and gatherings. They have to stay outside the camp. They have to stay outside the temple. They can't contribute to worship this way. And so some would say in an argument um, that this specific line of reasoning through Leviticus would say that these people that have harmed themselves in this way, that they've become transgender or they've altered the surgically, hormonally, whatever it is they've done to themselves, if they've done that, that they are excluded, that they've cut themselves off from the community of faith. There's some that would say that. And I would say in the Old Testament, maybe that's true. In the New Testament, we don't see any of those same rules re, uh, reaffirmed. In fact, we see the almost, what you might even be able to say, is the abolition of the priestly class and order with the establishment of the new covenant that you have that we are all a kingdom of priests now reiterated throughout the writings of paul john and peter that in fact um we're no longer relying on a priestly class to arbiter between us and god the veil was torn so now it is wide open in the same way that the gentiles are brought in Romans 9 10 11 the like Gentiles are brought in um, whereas it had exclusively been Jews before or the circumcised before maybe now it's wide open so that people even in this age that have affected themselves in this particular way they are still welcome they may um, and imagine the testimony present of somebody that's gone through some of these things and is still welcomed by the Holy Spirit of God. That's pretty incredible. So I would say that in the New Testament, we are definitely gladly welcomed in by the Holy Spirit that even the mutilation of flesh is not significant enough to exclude us from faith. But... It requires repentance like without the remission of sin right without the shedding of blood no remission of sin can occur right I've talked about that before that um, through Christ that the shame even of sin is eradicated but it requires repentance that you have to turn from those things renounce them and that so if you want to say that, yes, I am in Christ a new creation, you can't say that the creation God has made me is wrong. 
you can't hold those two conflicting thoughts together. If you want to say it like this, that two people, right, can't walk together unless they choose they're going to go in the same direction. Those two thoughts are conflicting. They are saying that God is wrong to have made me this way, but I want to trust him anyways. That's contradictory. There's a cognitive dissonance present there that can't be reconciled. So, um, I am of the, uh, per, my personal opinion is that all of this is product of the fall. Like, I don't know if that surprises anyone. I believe that, like, the reason we are in this mess is that Christians chose not to fight. They laid down their arms and surrendered on the matter of divorce. If Christians would have held the line and said, no, the Bible says we're not going to allow this in the church, then our society wouldn't have quietly rotted as quickly as it has. But um, when you start, that you can draw a straight line between that to same-sex attraction being normalized in our society, you can draw a straight line from that to where we are now. And that if we would have just held the line then, we would still be in conflict over that stuff. And that we wouldn't even be over here yet. But you can't undo the past, unfortunately. But I see this, that all of this, the main thing is to really reinforce biblical truth. God does not make mistakes. Therefore, it is not possible for you to have been born in the wrong flesh doesn't happen. It is not possible for you as a bearer of the Imago Dei, an image bearer of God. It is not possible for you to have been born a male inside of a female body or a female inside of a male body. This It can't logically happen. The second thing is that the problem is not your flesh. It's not your skin. It's not your muscles. It's not your brain even, generally, right? There is some um, wiring things to discuss here. There is some biochemical, hormonal things to discuss here. But it's your identity that's the problem. And if you change your name, if you do, if you take the hormones, you go through the surgery, top or bottom, whatever, you go through those surgeries, you are not satisfying the problem of that you still have a problem with your identity. You can put on a new hat or you can put on a new, like, a new name. You can put on a new set of wardrobe if you want to. That's not going to change your identity. It just is the performant aspects of a costume. And that eventually those things are going to wear out too. You're going to become dissatisfied with that identity as well. And then what? You've done irreparable damage to your body. You've done irreparable damage to your relationships. And now what? And a lot of people, in fact, we're far enough down this pipeline that we have a whole bunch of people that are trying to develop social media platforms on the idea of, I came down this road, lived for years, taking the hormones, even went through the surgeries, it didn't fix it, and they're trying to tell people that are ahead of them in the pipeline, saying, listen, we are over here, it's a dead end. We came down this road, it's a dead end, don't come down here, don't follow us. And of course, social media and its various overlords are diminishing them. They're intentionally throttling access to their pages, taking them down, community guidelines, the whole thing, because they are so desperate to normalize this behavior. They're unwilling to allow any sense of criticism. And there's books being written by non-Christians, psychological um profiles on this matter of saying that listen this is not good it's harmful it's abusive it's dangerous it's destroying people's lives stop 
and yet society is not willing, literally putting its fingers in its ears and shutting that out. It's not good. It's not good. So it's something we need to discuss that there are people already that they've done the irreparable damage to themselves and they're sorry. They're regretful of having done it. So we need to stem it up at the very beginning and say, no, listen, it's about your identity. That you need to start conditioning yourself. If you really believe that you can go through all this stuff to condition yourself to accept a new identity, you can put that same effort, energy, and um, so forth into the idea of reconditioning yourself to value your own natural identity as well. You can choose where to put that effort. So you can choose to accept yourself for the way you are. You can. But you have to choose to do that. And our society is not going to tell you that that's a good idea. They're going to say the opposite. They're going to say, no, you do need to change your name. You do need to stop letting people dead name you. You do need to reassign your pronouns. You do need to go through the surgeries or take the hormones or do the whatever. You need to because it's what's necessary for you to be who you are. In fact, they're not making you who you are. They're making you into something you're not. In fact, that's why the changes are necessary, right? So, uh, in their worldview. So, um, I think very clearly, this is a problem, a product of a sinful nature that is destroying a lot of people's lives. And that Christians need to A, not affirm it. Don't agree. Do not say, no, this is normal. Do not say, yes, this is acceptable. Don't do that because you are feeding people sinful natures. And then the next thing is that you need to welcome with open arms, sensitive ears, these people because they're hurting. They're hurting themselves and they're being hurt by the community that supposedly love, is pretending to love them. They need someone who's willing to infuse them with truth that's going to love and care for them enough to infuse them with the truth they don't want to hear. And if you're willing to do that as a church leader, you stand in a position to be able to rescue a lot of people that Satan has lied to them that it's already too far. It, they've gone too far. They've done too much. They've bought those lies. And you stand in a place that you could say to them, no, you haven't gone too far because Christ died, including died for you.